Let me welcome you to the eighth talk in this uh, quarterly series. So we've been doing this now for two years. Um, this time we're talking about Friedrich Nietzsche, and I titled this talk Friedrich Nietzsche, the Apex of the West and the Threat of Nihilism. So we're going to talk a good bit about this term nihilism and Nietzsche's uh, influence on culture. But in each of these talks, we try to take the philosopher, uh, whoever he or she is, and situate them in relation to what was going on at the time, what, what formed them, what they took part in. So, you know, we looked at Aristotle and his relationship with Alexander the Great, for example, or uh, Boethius and how, you know, Western culture was essentially falling apart at that time and the power struggles that were going on. We looked at Hannah Arendt. Uh, last, last year we, we capped her uh, as the, the end of the series. We looked at the Holocaust and totalitarianism. So this time, um, I, I wanted to pick somebody who you know everybody would have some views on. Um, he's like a very controversial figure, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, I should thank the Frank Weinberg Library and uh, Ashley Pike, the Adult Services Coordinator, and also my wife and partner Andy Shaka, who's not here tonight, but but you know who, who likes these series quite a bit and who helps to set them up. Um, and I should also mention that we've been renewed for another year worth of talks. So they don't have the bookmarks yet uh, because I haven't given the information to Ashley yet, but we're going to start with Cicero in the spring, a uh, great Latin philosopher, a uh, very interesting guy, you'll, you'll see why. And then for our medieval thinker, around May, we'll talk about Augustine of Hippo, the uh, great uh, you know, convert, you could say, somebody who knew sin inside and out because he committed many of them. Um, then uh, for the modern period, We'll do John Locke, and we'll cap the year off by talking about uh, Albert Camus, uh, 20th century thinker. So, um, and I should also mention one other thing, <laughs> a lot of, of uh, provisos before this. We do actually have a, a free webinar coming up this month. If you're interested in that, I can tell you more about it. Uh, next week, Monday, the I think it's the 13th, um, we're doing a 45-minute webinar on Nietzsche. Um, using our, our, our Reason.io site, and then we have some more intensive online seminars, two-hour-long seminars on Saturday. So if, you're, if you want more Nietzsche, that, that's one way to get it. Um, those are going to be focused mostly on this uh, early book, The Birth of Tragedy, and some of the things that are going on in there. Tonight we're going to talk about, you know, sort of the totality of Nietzsche's works. So in each of these talks, um, what I try to do, like I said, is situate the philosopher in relation to his or her own times, talk about maybe some of the contributions they make, because it's kind of a back and forth process. They're formed and shaped by the issues of their time. They think about it, but they also affect it as well. So it's not just a one-way street. And with Nietzsche, I think we can say there's, there's a lot going on there of, of this sort. Um, what I'm going to talk about then is, is so what, what was going on in the 19th century and some of the culture uh, of the, the time, some of the developments. We'll look at Nietzsche's own life, and then we'll dive into this issue of nihilism. And we'll talk about how Nietzsche himself contributed to understanding it, um, some of his own uh, other ideas that fit in with his response to it, and then we can talk about Nietzsche's influence. At any point, if you've got questions or comments that you want to make, we can, we can stop, we can consider them. I can always get us back on track, um, sort of like a horse that knows the, the trail, especially with a thinker like Nietzsche, who I've been interested in uh, since I was a teenager. Uh, and probably, you know, quite frankly, I, I can say that uh, probably half of the time that I read Nietzsche, I misunderstood him, especially when I was younger. Uh, I was taking the wrong ideas from him, but I think that's that's quite common with, with Nietzsche and with many other thinkers. Albert Camus, the same sort of story. I started reading him when I was 14, and I don't think I really understood more than a tenth of what I was reading. Um, Nietzsche became somebody I was very interested in when I was in graduate school um, as, as a, a student working on my master's and then on my PhD. I even went through what I would call a Nietzsche phase, where I thought that he was the philosopher. You know, and I used to argue with some of the other graduate students about how we ought to interpret Nietzsche properly, how we ought to apply him. 
And I think like many other people who get interested in Nietzsche, I tried to figure out what it would be like to be the Superman, the Ubermensch. And uh, that turns out to be very difficult to do. So we'll, we will talk about that theme, but uh, I, I ended up moving out of that into other things. But Nietzsche has remained for me somebody who I think is centrally important, especially for understanding the 19th century, the 20th century, um, you know, where philosophy is today. Uh, he's probably, you know, if you had to pick top 10 philosophers, he's probably going to be in there for, for a lot of people. So let's talk about the 19th century. Um, very heady times, you know. It begins with these Napoleonic wars in, in Europe. Uh, Europe is in a ferment, uh, and the Napoleonic wars were not just this guy uh, who was a general, who actually wasn't quite as short as they make him out to be. You know, that's that's a, a bit of a, a, a historical foible. Um, but he was definitely imperialistic, and he, would, he had a France that had been vitalized by the French Revolution and turned essentially into a military machine. And he was attempting to unite Europe into one big system. And then these other European powers are trying to resist it. Eventually Napoleon loses. Um, it was quite a, uh, a run that he had, but you know, he invades Russia, loses most of his army there, comes back to raise yet another army in France. And by that time, the German states are in rebellion and engaging in wars of liberation. Britain has been mixing it up the entire time. And after Napoleon's gone, there's a new configuration of power in Europe. You know, they, the, the powers that are there become much more conservative. They want to keep this sort of revolutionary activity from happening. And, and you could say that revolution was one of the great themes of what's happening in the 19th century. Um, revolutions, not just in terms of political causes and reconfigurations, but also in terms of transformation of society. So we have these, these uh, social conflicts going on. You know, This is the century that sees not just Marx and Engels writing the Communist Manifesto, but all sorts of socialist and utopian ideals being, being put forward. Some of them even here in the States. Uh, think about some of what the Transcendentalists were doing. Um, there's, there's great discussions of, you know, what do the classes owe each other? You know, those, those who are, you know, making a lot of money through uh, industrial capitalism. Do they owe anything to the mass of the workers? Um, who should be in charge? All of these things become contested. Um, some of the countries within Europe are, are still being governed in, in rather archaic ways by a king or nobles. Some of them become democracies, and you know we, we know from our own you know recent elections that democracy can sometimes be very exciting, and uh, but it's also prone to all sorts of crazy conflicts. Now just imagine new democracies where there isn't a like 200 year tradition like we have of holding elections and, and all this sort of stuff. Think back to what our what our early elections were like and how much crazy stuff went on. That's what's happening across Europe. Um, you could say that politically you've got, you know, not only, you know, sort of progressivism, you know, that wants to change society, uh, teaming up against a kind of conservatism, which looks different in, in, in different places, but you've also got these radicals who want to totally transform society. This is an idea that, you know, really took currency in the French Revolution and continues on. Um, there's also struggles over religion going on within Europe. Europe had seen uh, several hundred years of religious wars, uh, sometimes very bloody, you know, which, which at one point cost Germany about half of its population just two centuries before that. And um, <coughs> a lot of those things have been sort of sorted out by then. Uh, instead, it's, it's a question, how do we interpret traditional religion? Some people are calling for to get rid of it altogether. The French Revolution had, in fact, been an anti-clerical revolution. They took all these monks and nuns and, and you know, put them into lay life. And there, there were, you know, a lot of people who resisted and then, then were guillotined as a result. Um, you know, within, pro, within, you might say, the entire Protestant spectrum, particularly in Germany, there's a lot of rethinking about how do we adapt um, religion, traditional Christianity, to a modern age. And there's a lot of controversy and disputes between people. And actually, the notion of nihilism is going to emerge 
originally from those, those debates. Um, nationalism is becoming stronger and stronger. Not only uh, the French, you know, totally conscious of themselves as a nation, the English similarly conscious, uh, although the Welsh are kind of dragged along and some other people are dragged along in the process. Uh, but the Germans, uh, in, in the previous centuries, you know, you had German states, and you still have this notion of the Holy Roman Empire and electing people, uh, you know, to be in charge, to be the emperor. But the emperor had no power by it by that point. And that's, that's pretty much abolished. Instead, you have Austria, you have Bavaria, and you have Prussia, which is going to end up dominating Germany as sort of the big contenders for where, where German leadership might come from. And there's this sense, especially after the French raise hell all across Europe, that, well, you might be better off if you actually band together and have some sort of cohesive governmental structure. So one of the key things that's happening in the 19th century is uh, Germany finally becoming no longer just a nation, but a state. Similarly, uh, Italy is going through the same sort of process, uh, in part because they're unhappy about getting kicked around by everybody else as well. Um, you, you know, when you look at the timeline, you'll see things like Bulgaria revolting, Serbia revolting against the Ottoman Empire, and these new countries, well, not entire, new, new states, definitely, emerging on the map. Um, each of which has their own uh, ambitions in, in the region and starts making alliances. So there's this uh, you know, great you know, expansion going on of, of this, this nationalist impulse. Um, there's also you know, a focus on national liberation, whether it's from the Turks or the French or the, the yoke of the English and their commerce or from the Russians, the Polish revolt against the Russians at one point, unfortunately getting crushed in the process, which would become a dress rehearsal for crushing some of the Russian nihilists a bit later. Um, and what else is happening in this time? Colonialism. You know, we, we here were originally a colony, right, of, of England. And so colonialism had been going on for quite some time, but it really takes off in the 19th century. By the time that Nietzsche dies, there's only a little bit of the world that hasn't been colonized by the European powers. You have Siam, uh, nowadays Thailand, as an independent country. There's, you know, little tribal areas here and there where, where there, you know, whatever colonial power really hasn't taken over. There's Liberia, uh, begun by, by freed slaves who then instituted their own sort of power dynamics on, on the, the native population, uh, which we're still seeing the effects of in civil wars today. Um, and then there was Ethiopia. Uh, almost every place else had been, in effect, colonized. I suppose you could say Afghanistan as well, um, because the, the Russians tried their hand in Afghanistan, so did the British, and uh, neither of them really succeeded in managing to, to govern it. But for the most part, the, the world gets divvied up, right? And the old colonial powers like uh, Spain, you know, there's a revolt very early on on this continent, well, to the continent of the south, sorry, South America, in this hemisphere, against the Spanish, and all these new countries emerge. Um, Brazil becomes independent of Portugal during the Napoleonic times. Um, Portugal really doesn't operate as much of a colonial power, so it's, you know, Britain, uh, France, the new Germany. Italy gets its little hand in and start, starts trying to take over places. Um, Everybody wants colonies, and the Russians are, are playing around with things themselves. The Chinese are being divvied up by, between the European and even American power. So you've got that going on. Um, there's some significant wars that take place during this century, both in Europe and in the rest of the world. And there's massive changes on the economic scene. I mean, if you think about what things were like, um, just take any, any area of life. Think about warfare. You know, In the Napoleonic Wars, they were fighting, uh, most of the casualties came from artillery, um, in part because, uh, you know, artillery was so, so powerful, and the muskets they, they were using were pretty inaccurate. By the time of the American Civil War, it's almost completely reversed. The riflery has become so accurate that that's where the bulk of the actual, you know, casualties are coming from. Of course, more people are still dying of disease than of, of battlefield, battlefield wounds, uh, at that time, but even that is changing. You know, they're learning how to 
cut up the body in efficient ways. We're not quite at the point of having uh, antibiotics, but that is going to come fairly soon in the next century. Um, technology, uh, economics, um, the, the, the development of the sciences, all of these are happening not only here in America, but even more in Europe, especially in Germany, in France, in, um, in Britain. Uh, Russia is being affected by it. Russia is kind of trying to figure out who they are. Are they European? Are they something different? There's a lot of people trying to sort of, uh, you know, anglicize or, or Germanize Russia uh, involved there. Infrastructure is spreading throughout the, the land. It's becoming possible to travel quite easily. So somebody like Nietzsche will, you know, become a vagabond uh, in, in the later part of the century. And communications. Um, a lot of the inventions that I put on the, the, the culture timeline are things like the, trans the transatlantic telegraph cable is finally laid. You can talk between um, continents. Or, you know, later on we have the, the telegraph, or not, not the, just the telegraph, the uh, phonograph. Uh, we have the telephone. We have all of these things being developed. There, you know, we talk about globalism making us a smaller world. That really was happening at the time. Um, along with this, we have, you know, just amazing developments happening in culture, in the arts. You know, think about the visual arts. Uh, not just, you know, the fact that we then got photography, which is kind of a big deal. And, and towards the end of the century, we've been moving pictures. But think about painting. And the fact that, you know, I think you all know that story when the, the uh, Impressionists first exhibited People were actually trying to strike at the paintings with their canes. We go to the, the, the art museum and we look at that stuff. And we're like, yeah, that's that's pretty, you know. Uh, I like the way, I like what they did to the colors. This was revolutionary to people. It was it was changing the way that they they see things. Music. Um, somebody who Nietzsche is going to become involved with is a major innovator. Uh, uh, Richard Wagner uh, is is changing music. Yeah, literature, philosophy, all these all these other fields. Culture is, is uh, in the process of change. And so some of the people I want to mention, I don't think we'll stop for a little you know, Q&A or discussion, that are, that are involved in some important developments uh, in terms of the culture that affected Nietzsche in particular would be Arthur Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer was a German philosopher, not all that well known in part because he, he was kind of a jerk, and he also uh, tried to square off against Hegel at a time when Hegel was extraordinarily popular. But by Nietzsche's time, people are, are, are actually reading him. And Nietzsche draws quite a bit on him. Uh, Schopenhauer, if we had to just pick like a one-line you know, thumbnail sketch, he said that the world is fundamentally irrational, full of suffering, and that's what's most fundamentally real is the will, not the intellect, uh, but the will and that drives everything else. And the will itself is irrational, but we can figure out how to make our way in a world that's, that's almost entirely screwed up. Um, he said, this is the worst of all possible worlds, in response to Leibniz saying this is the best of all possible worlds. Um, Søren Kierkegaard, uh, another, uh, he's Danish. Um, he is another person reacting against Hegel and the Hegelianism of his time. Um, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche are often brought together along with Fyodor Dostoevsky as the fathers of existentialist philosophy. Right? Now, there may be a context in which you've heard all three of these brought together. Kierkegaard um, is, a, is a religious thinker, but also a very important philosophical thinker and a social critic who uh, argues against um, some of the tendencies that he sees in his day to reduce the individual to just a part of the system. And... Um, Nietzsche is actually going to find out about Kierkegaard towards the end of his life through, through another Danish guy uh, who we'll talk about. David Strauss. Um, anybody know why he's important? I mean, have you heard of him? Um, he's kind of old hat now. Does that ring a bell for anybody? He wrote a, um, a, a critical uh, study of the Gospels. So he's one of the people applying what we call the critical method to these religious texts. He's engaged in, in the process of reinterpreting Christianity. And like many of the, the, the you know, critics of that time, he's saying a lot of the stuff that religious people believe in is just mumbo-jumbo and crazy stuff. If we strip away what we can actually determine as historically 
possible, we get a very different, um, you know, picture of things. And uh, you know, for for his efforts, of course, he's 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 you know sort of one of the bad boys of, of Germany at the time, and people hate him for it. But he has a very important effect. Karl Marx. What do we think of Marx in terms of? That's that's and that ironically, that's a collaboration, right? So although we, we think of well, that's Marx's work. That's Marx and Engels together. Um, what else is Marx particular? And that's a great work, the Communist Manifesto. The specter is haunting Europe. I mean, that's a nice way to start. We're going to talk about that in in a moment. Um, but what else does does this Marx guy do? He's very good at political maneuvering. You know, all the other communists wind up being less important than him uh, for one reason or another. You know, he writes a book called Capital, where he tries to show how economics <coughs> really works, as opposed to what people, you know, a lot of very smart people at the time are saying is going on economically. Um, you know, a book that important. Uh, Thomas Pinketty wrote something like that recently, um, uh, and it's equally dense and equally <laughs> difficult to summarize, um, but but you know, equally. Important, you might say, and Marx is trying to show everybody that economics is really driving everything. You know that the social forces that we don't really understand are uh, in charge, and that we might be able to tweak them and get them to do the right things. Uh, Richard Wagner, he's not a philosopher, although he kind of thought it. I think he thought he was, uh, and I think Nietzsche kind of thought he was. What's he known for? Opera. Yeah. Well, what kind? Is it like soft and sweet, like Mozart opera? Six hours long. <laughs> I mean, you gotta go to the bathroom before you go to a boxer opera. Yeah. Tristan it, and his old. Uh, yeah. Really long. What else do you think? It's long, but what else? What else sort of impresses you? If you had to like sum up Wagner, besides well, the Teutonic influences of okay. the subject matter. Oh, the, that's right. He's taking, uh, and this is kind of tying in with the nationalism of the time. Uh, let's let's you know revitalize German culture this way. Um, you know, he added uh, extra horns, particularly that on the on the low end to the orchestra. He made changes in how the orchestra was set up so that it would be louder. It would be more powerful. He he develops what. Uh, I'm trying to remember the German phrase. I think it's Gesamte Kunstwerk, meaning the, to the total artwork, right? It takes in everything. It's not just sound coming at you like a wall. It's also these stories that are also very you know, heroic and lots of stuff going on. And ideally, you're, you're like totally surrounded by it. So he's, he's rethinking how artwork functions and how we might immerse people. I mean, to, to some people, Wagner is actually sort of a forerunner of uh, things that we're, we're still experimenting with today. I have to admit, I don't really, I don't get into Wagner myself. Uh, my wife really does. She really loves his stuff. Uh, but I, I kind of have some of the same reaction that, well, that you Lenny, do. <laughs> Lenny Riefenstahl used the Ride of the Valkyrie oh, to sure. underscore yeah. Hitler in his plane flying through the sky, which he did... Uh, uh, not bondage of the will, that's the wrong one. Uh, triumph of the will. Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful piece. Uh, they used it in um, Apocalypse Now as well. You know, the, you know, the air cab coming in, playing it uh, out of these loudspeakers to terrorize the, the people who they're attacking. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of... I think that's probably one of the most adapted pieces, right? You see it uh, in, in comedies, you see it in tragedies, you see it in mm -hmm. propaganda pieces. Uh, yeah. So let's talk now about Nietzsche himself. And I, I gave you a timeline that, that really has three things on it. Friedrich Nietzsche, other people, and then sort of general European culture. And of course, I didn't try to summarize everything on here. It would have been like a scroll that you'd have to unroll. Uh, so, you know, I, I highlighted more like, you know, certain, certain uh, interesting scientific discoveries or technology or um, certain political events. But, but there's all, you can also see these other... People like David Strauss, right, writing the life of, of, J of Jesus. Alexis de Tocqueville with his Democracy in America, 1835. Um, this is 10 years roughly before Nietzsche is born. 
So he's coming into a context in which there's already a lot of political ferment going on. Uh, he's born in this place, uh, Rukin, um, and he doesn't uh, he doesn't get to have a father very long. His, his dad dies. The official um, uh, verdict is softening of the brain. Nobody's quite sure what that means, um, but it's some sort of mental disease. And his brother uh, dies. His brother is about two years old. He dies fairly uh, soon after that as well. And the family relocates to Naumburg uh, in, in, in another part of Germany. Uh, they move in with some, some relatives. Um, and Nietzsche, you know, does pretty good as a, a kid. He, he attends these, uh, he attends a, a gymnasium. Uh, a gymnasium would be sort of like, you know, I think of it as a college prep sort of school, you know. Uh, like, like we have some here in, in this area. Um, he starts writing, and he writes one of the very early essays uh, by the time that, that he's, he's uh, 12, uh, On the Origin of Evil. Uh, nobody really looks at that stuff because you don't expect great things of, of, of a 12-year-old. Um, but, you know, he's, he's writing, and he gets accepted into this Forda school, which, again, think, again, college prep. Uh, nice place to be. And he... Uh, meets uh, Paul Dusen, who he's going to become a friend, writes a piece on music, and eventually he's going to go to, um, to college. And he uh, starts studying philology uh, in Bonn. He writes on moods. And he's going to leave Bonn, uh, which is a nice place to study. But th this is the thing that happens with a lot of students. You, you find a professor who you really want to work with, in Nietzsche's case, it's this guy, Ritchell, um, a philologist. Um, and philology at that time, you know, it, it, what we would call it now is classics, right? It, it, officially, it's the, sort of the study of language. You had, like, uh, theological philology, which Nietzsche started out in, and then you had classical philology. We would just, we would just call it classics, and we don't have that many departments, unfortunately, that still do this, and they're, they're kind of closing uh, quite a few of them up. In, in our culture, but it was understood as an important part of education. Um, and, and Nietzsche's going to draw a lot of his insights from his philological studies. By studying language, by, by studying literature, you can learn a lot. So he, he goes to Leipzig uh, in, uh, in Saxon to continue to study with Ritchell, and there he reads Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer has a very important early effect on, on him in his studies. Um, he does military service twice. The first time, he um, you know, does military service uh, with a, an artillery regiment, a horse artillery regiment, a Prussian one, because uh, Prussia now is sort of uniting Germany. And he manages to injure himself, um, screwing around on a horse, jumping onto it. He hits himself on the pommel and it bruises his ribs. If any of you have ever had bruised ribs, it's worse than cracking a rib. It uh, hurts for a long, long time. I, I know from experience, because I actually did it myself, but it wasn't jumping on a horse. It was uh, reaching for something in uh, a car and hitting myself on, on, on the, the wrong thing that I, I had there. And boy, that hurt for like, you know, three, four months. Um, so I can just imagine what, what poor Nietzsche was going through. Because, you know, he was actually up for rank in, in the military at the time. It seemed to be doing pretty good with it. Um, he meets and befriends Richard Wagner, uh, starts writing uh, more stuff, Homer and the classical philology, and eventually he is appointed a professor. Now notice, where is, where is he getting appointed? It's not in Germany. Switzerland. Yeah, Basel, um, which is actually in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. Um, Ball, you know. Nice place to be. I've, I've, I've been there. Um, most places in Switzerland are actually pretty nice uh, at, at, at present. And he, he becomes uh, a university professor. So now he's got kind of an established life, right? Um, and he becomes friends with Franz Overbeck, who's going to be somebody else uh, who, who he writes to. Then he does military service, again, as a hospital attendant during the Franco-Prussian War. Um, hospitals were not a good place to be as they still pretty much are today. They're, they're a good place to get healed. They're also a great place to get sick. He gets sick. He gets uh, dysentery and diphtheria. Probably lucky he didn't get uh, something worse. Some people think he may have actually contracted uh, syphilis. Uh, there, there's a lot of theories about what went wrong later in his life. Nobody's really quite sure. We don't have the, 
the, the documentation for that. And then he writes this really important work, his first major work, The Birth of Tragedy. It's actually called The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music. And it's a revolutionary reinterpretation of what Greek tragedy was about with these very major sort of uh, uh, you know, big picture overtones. And Wagner thinks it's great. Wagner praises it to the skies. The main guy who you really needed to impress at the time, who I've got on here, um, Ulrich von Willemowitz uh, Müllendorf says, this is not a good book. And so that's a kind of a blow to, to Nietzsche's prestige uh, and his career. And you notice he's not going to write all that much until later on. Um, he becomes friends with this guy, Paul Ray, who he'll mention uh, in some of his works. Later on, he's going to meet uh, uh, Lou Salome through Paul Ray. Uh, by 1876, he, he breaks with Wagner. He says, this guy's just a buffoon. Um, I was mistaken about him. He's not revolutionizing German music. Uh, he's, he's actually making it worse. Uh, you know, it, 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 he goes from one side to, to the other. And um, then he, he, he publishes uh, another major work, Human All Too Human. This is a really nice early work, and it's it's not systematic. Much of Nietzsche's philosophy is actually rather anti-systematic. Human, all too human, is, is essays and aphorisms, um, and you've got to kind of piece together what's what's going on in it. Um, he starts to experience some bad health. Uh, he has migraines, eyesight problems. Uh, he actually resigns from the university, and then he begins his, his wandering years, and he's going to do that more or less the rest of his life until his mental breakdown. Um, he only stays in each place for a couple months and then moves on somewhere else. Uh, during some of this time, <clears throat> he's incredibly productive. Some of the time, he's totally incapacitated. He's actually writing his own prescriptions uh, and, and, and filling them, because you could get away with that back then, signing them uh, Dr. Nietzsche. Um, you know, what kind of doctor was he? He was not a medical doctor. <laughs> he was a doctor of, of philology. But, you know, uh, that's the sort of thing that you, you could do. And he, he starts having more and more uh, experiences, uh, connections. Um, he, he writes, you know, the Mor uh, uh, Morgan Rota, The Dawn. Um, sometimes, you know, it's translated in other ways. And then uh, we get um, his meeting with Lou Solomon who is with Paul Ray at the time. Salome is a very interesting character in her own right. Um, if any of you are interested in Rainer Maria Rilke, the great uh, German language poet, um, it's hard to say exactly what nationality, I guess Czech we could, we could say, although you know, he was part of the Austrian Empire at the time. Um, he spent time with her later on, after, after, actually after Nietzsche dies. Um, she became a uh, student of Freud and is one of the very first female psychoanalysts. Um, at this time, she's involved with, with Ray, um, and she also, you know, has these, these sort of dalliances with Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche, um, you know, tries to get something going with her, never succeeds. Um, again, there's speculation that maybe she gave him syphilis. Probably not true at all, you know. Uh, there, there's all sorts of crazy stuff out there, but it doesn't work out. Um, and Nietzsche is very active at this time. He writes The Gay Science. Um, he starts writing in 1883, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, uh, where Zarathustra, uh, you know, Zoaster is one of the central characters. Got no connection whatsoever with the actual historical Persian uh, you know, uh, founder of a religion, but he's a very important sort of character, and that book actually gets read quite a bit, uh, not only later on, but in, in Nietzsche's own time. One of the, the, the tragedies of Nietzsche's life is that people aren't really reading him all that much until later on when he's uh, incapacitated by, by mental illness. Um, by 1886, he breaks with his publisher, Ernst uh, Schmeitzner, um, in part because he says, this guy is publishing all this anti-Semitic stuff. I don't want my, my stuff just getting buried in this, this crap. Um, I'm going to start publishing it myself. So in a way, if you think about, you know, uh, 
we, we portray Nietzsche as a philosopher. And we think about philosophers as these, you know, kind of sedate academic types. Nietzsche is really more of an entrepreneur by this point in his life. He's traveling, he's financing his own travels, um, he's meeting people, he's networking, he's self-publishing, he's doing a lot of really interesting stuff. A lot of it sort of, uh, you know, a voice crying in the wilderness at this point in time, but that, that's happening. You notice that he, he encounters Dostoevsky. Uh, he reads uh, uh, Dostoevsky's works and he says, this guy really, I can see what's going on here. He and I have some sort of connection. He's a great psychologist. And then he publishes what myself, I actually consider his, his, his greatest work, which is The Genealogy of Morals. Um, many, many other people I think would disagree with me and say other texts by Nietzsche are more important, but I, I think that's actually the best one. Um, and what I gave you as a handout here is, is, is uh, something connected with that. I'll talk about that. But notice in 1888, this guy is just churning out works. You know, The Case of Wagner, Twilight of the Idols, The Antichrist, Etche Homo, Nietzsche Contra Wagner. He begins a correspondence with the uh, uh, Scandinavian playwright August Strindberg. Um, and then uh, soon after that, in 1889, he suffers a mental breakdown. Um, the story is that, that he's in Turin, and he sees a horse being whipped, which was kind of a common thing at the time. He goes, puts his arms around the horse to prevent it from being whipped, collapses. They put him in a uh, hospital. They realize that there's something wrong with the guy, and he starts writing letters to his friends, signing them Dionysus, uh, you know, somebody who had been important in his, his uh, uh, stories, or not in his stories, in his, his philosophy. And his friends realize he is nuts by this point. There's something really wrong here. So they, they manage to bring him back um, to Jena, where he's hospitalized. Um, by, the, by this time, his sister is starting to get into the, the picture. She had married, you notice in this thing, she'd married this anti-Semite, um, Fürste, and he, she, he and, and her attempted to found a um, thing that they called New Germany in Paraguay. Paraguay was like one of the places you could go with your crazy ideas back then. Uh, you know, you could almost like set things up from the ground up. Uh, you could get away with just about anything. And that's what they did. When he kills himself, she moves back and she sort of takes charge of Nietzsche. She takes charge over his literary works. Um, she starts forcing people out, starts, you know, saying, this guy's not a good doctor. He's not handling the case. Um, and eventually she has complete control over his works. He dies uh, finally in 1900, uh, right at the turn of the century of pneumonia. And notice that one of his great works is published after he dies, The Will to Power. These were a set of notes that he'd been working on. And The Will to Power is going to have a really interesting history. We, we now have, you know, sort of the full thing. But his sister Elizabeth, who was a raging anti-Semite, um, she puts the, the notes together in, in a form that's going to sort of fit her, what her mentality of what he's supposed to be teaching. This is why Nietzsche was so easily co-opted by the Nazis, um, because of what his sister had done. Um, Nietzsche actually was not a fan of German nationalism. He, he writes in very derogatory terms about the Germans, and uh, not only in the medieval times, but in the modern times. He, he writes in similarly scathing terms about anti-Semites. He does, of course, attack Judaism. He does, of course, attack Christianity. Um, but he's, he thinks the anti-Semites are about as low as you can get. So what she's doing is, is you know, it really uh, falsifying the, the picture of, of his, his work. So I've, I've talked now a lot. and we've been, We're about 40 minutes in. Um, we should pause, I suppose, for some questions, and I'll tell you about nihilism and how Nietzsche fits into that, because that's in the title. We haven't gotten to it yet. So any questions or comments or issues, objections to the way I've told the story? Because goodness knows people could object. You know, Any history it tells is kind of selective. Or should we just, should we just go into yeah. nihilism? All right, let's jump right into the darkness. So... This term nihilism, it comes from the Latin word nothing, nihil, right? And 
If you ask like 20 people who know anything about nihilism, uh, what nihilism is today, you're probably going to get 20 different answers. Uh, because it's taken on a lot of different senses over time. The original use of it is actually within a religious context. This guy, Jacobi, who is, uh, you know, in the sort of German, uh, well, let's call it German idealist. He's not really an idealist, but he, he fits into that spectrum. He's criticizing Kant and Fichte, these two German philosophers that said that, you know, um, we, in effect, create the reality that we're, we're seeing. Uh, our minds project order onto the world. We don't actually know what's out there in the world independently of our minds. Um, and he says, this is nihilism. It's going to reduce us to not knowing anything. Um, instead of this crazy stuff, we should rely on faith. We should adopt uh, what we nowadays call fideism. Um, we, should, we should say faith will reveal everything for us. Um, and, you know, the, the term has kind of a currency. Uh, Strauss, I mentioned, uh, he gets called a nihilist, but nobody really takes much notice of calling people that at the time. Uh, Feuerbach, Ludwig Feuerbach, a uh, very important humanist, he gets called that. Uh, Max Stirner, uh, egoist philosopher, he gets called a nihilist. And the idea is you call somebody a nihilist to say, if you go down this path, it's going to lead to chaos. It's going to lead to... to th nobody's going to know anything. Nobody's going to be able to, to hold any moral truths to be self-evident. It's all going to be like a free-for-all. You don't want to do that, right? So don't go with those nihilists. Then it becomes uh, uh, a popular term in Russia. You might say, well, why, why would it jump from Germany to Russia? Well, the Russians were very influenced by German culture, just as they were by English and French culture. And... Um, there's a guy, Turgenev, who um, has got a book, that, I don't know if any of you have read it, called Fathers and Sons. Beautiful uh, story. I, I like Turgenev. I'm kind of a fan. And there's a character in it whose name is Bazarov. Bazarov calls himself a nihilist. And, you know, at first the other characters are like, what is this? And they're trying to figure it out. And, well, it means nothing. So he must be for nothing. And, and Bazarov explains that, you know, they're there to change Russia. But they don't really believe in anything. They, or they believe in whatever they want. No values are going to hold them back. And this kind of gets the ball rolling. The nihilists become a force in Russia. Um, and so you have this period from like the 1860s on uh, where it, it's kind of a counterculture within Russia. It's scandalous. And, you know, if you're a conservative, when you find a nihilist, well, you whip them. That'll, that'll take the, the nihilism out of them, you know. But the nihilists are for all sorts of things like free love, um, uh, at least for some people, or freeing the serfs, or, you know, doing this, changing things. Uh, and they're questioning everybody. So in a way, they're kind of more skeptics than, than straight up nihilists. Then it takes a turn. Uh, you get this guy, uh, Nechayev. Uh, who writes this pamphlet, The Catechism of a Revolutionist. And um, this argues that, look, the European monarchies, the power structure, is using the ideas of Machiavelli. Look at what the Jesuits are doing. They use, they'll do anything to achieve their ends. There was a big fear of Jesuits at the time. Um, it's kind of, I mean, if you look at Jesuits today, it's kind of hard to square that with the fears that people had now, or back then, because they seem kind of almost like powerless now, but uh, there was a big fear of that. And so um, this guy was arguing, if we want to free the serfs or we want to have a better society, we have to do so by any means necessary. Nothing should stand in our way. There's nothing that we can't do. And he took nihilism from being a kind of, you know, almost like a party boy philosophy, right, to being this hardcore, austere, we are the wave of the future thing. And they start assassinating people. Um, and eventually, they, they manage to assassinate the Tsar. As you can imagine, there's a crackdown <laughs> after that. And a lot of the nihilists are just wiped out. You know? To be a nihilist in Russia after that is basically a death sentence. And so the word now has come to mean something like a terrorist, or you know, these people who don't believe in anything. Oscar Wilde actually writes a play in which a nihilist is, is a main character. 
Um, and there's a lot of worries about, you know, what's going on in, in Europe. You know, are the young people getting into this sort of thing? Nietzsche, yeah. Basically to be like ISIS or something like that. Well, there's a lot of discussion about is ISIS basically nihilistic or do they believe in something? I mean, it's interesting because ISIS, you know, from what we can tell, seems pretty opportunistic. Um, a lot of the people who got into it, you, you know, they'd ask them, well, what Quranic verses have you actually memorized? Oh, I haven't memorized any. I just want to fight, you know. Like, eh, you're not really doing the same thing that is like these other movements. Um, so there, there's some question about that. There's there's a lot of other movements that get, get um, called nihilistic in our, our own time. Um, and, and so let's talk about Nietzsche then. So Nietzsche sees nihilism uh, as sort of the funda fundamental uh, problem of the modern human condition. But he understands it in a different way. It's no longer just about like individuals who say, screw the power structure. We're going we're gonna to change things up because nothing really matters. Instead, he's thinking about the entire culture. And he says, nihilism occurs when the highest values devalue themselves. So you mentioned the death of God, right? <clears throat> um, Nietzsche is associated with saying, or somebody in here did, God is dead, yeah. oh, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. so... What does he mean by that? Does he mean that there was actually some, you know, cosmic god figure who at one point maybe didn't get fed or, you know, um, you know tripped down the stairs and he died and now there's like a power vacuum and maybe somebody could go in and fill that? No, he means that whatever it is that we consider to be the highest value. In, in the Middle Ages, this was God. And, and in, you know, the Enlightenment, science replaced that. Whatever it is that we put at the top has shown us that it's not really what we thought it was, that its promises are false, that our will to truth leads us into more and more tangles, that it doesn't provide us with happiness, that it doesn't provide us with this sort of everybody can get along. Instead, as Nietzsche said, we look into the abyss. And, you know, he's got that famous line, you look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into you. Uh, people have been making jokes about that recently. You know, you look into the abyss, the, the abyss looks into you, and then you realize that, sorry, the abyss was actually looking at the guy behind you, you know, because he <laughs> waved and looked like a jackass because of that. But the idea is, when we get down to things, there isn't any true meaning in life. There's nothing guaranteed. Um, and our culture presents us with all sorts of, you know, things that says, here's, here's where to identify your place. You know, fit yourself into this hierarchy, and you will know where you, you belong, and life will make sense. The death of God means, no, that's vacant, and everything else starts to kind of crumble, which means that anybody can do just about anything to anybody else, and things start to get very dicey, because people need meaning, and they'll, they'll do just about anything to get it. They'll identify with some political movement, They'll identify with some, some new religious movement. They'll turn to crime and, and think that by doing that, they're going to somehow change things. Um, so Nietzsche is really concerned about this. He's not a nihilist himself, but he thinks that we can't avoid dealing with this. And if you look at what happens to European culture after Nietzsche, um, you know, things are looking pretty good up until this point. Okay, you've got some political terrorism, and every once in a while there's a revolt, you know, the workers and stuff like that. And, you know, there's some wars. But in general, aren't things getting better and better and better in Europe as we reach the turn of the century? You know, medicine, people are living longer. We're kind of unlocking the secrets of what's in our, our crazy heads, you know. Um, communications are, are proceeding. Um, you know, all the, the other people in the world are under the European yoke and being civilized by them. You know, we're getting more and more civilized ourselves. Look, even the, the dirty, you know, workers and the masses, we're, we're civilizing them. And then, and then what happens to sort of throw this a real monkey wrench into it? Uh, after Nietzsche's died. What's the... World War I. World War I, yeah, because why would the most civilized countries in the world go into a war with each other over silly stuff, you know, the, the assassination, assassination of an archduke and some alliances, kill off an entire generation of young men in horrific circumstances, 
you know, the people who went through that, they're like, this is all BS. This European culture you talk about, I don't know what, you're, what you mean. I, what I know is the trenches. And you have a whole new generation of, of you know, people sort of being raised with that and seeing that the great promises of what Dostoevsky called the Crystal Palace, they, they don't come true. And then soon after that, we have, you know, the, the, we have the, of course, the Russian Revolution, and we have the Russian Civil War. We have the rise of the, the sort of radical right, fascism in Italy, in other places as well. Uh, the communists are a major threat. They really were, indeed, a major threat. So the, the Russians had the ambition of turning everybody in Europe uh, to, to, to the red side. And, um, we also see a, a worldwide depression. Uh, you know, things just go into chaos. So maybe there is something to this nihilism business. You know, we could call it cultural rot. You know, the notion that the culture that we've been sold doesn't really deliver on its promises. So then the question is, what do we do in that case? Do we say, oh, well, screw it. Everybody is a faker. Everybody is full of it. I may as well just get mine. And, or I may as well try to build the biggest empire I can, or I may as well just, you know, uh, break the laws and do, do whatever I want, or maybe even I'll be the one enforcing the laws. That'll be even better. I'll, I'll, I'll be the cop, and then I can do whatever the hell I want because nobody's even watching me while I enforce the laws on everybody else. So do we do that? Nietzsche actually uh, proposes something different, and this is where we get to this, this uh, handout that I gave you, which is very complex, and I, I don't expect you to... Like, you know, look at it now. There is no test or anything like that. But I'll, I'll give it to you in a, in a nutshell. Nietzsche thinks that this is one of his key ideas. Nihilism is not something radically new. It's always been there lurking in the background. It's, it's become pressing in our time. And one of the reasons it's become pressing in our time is not just because, you know, the death of God and the highest values devaluing themselves. It's because... Are, are the ways in which we value things are fundamentally screwed up. He thinks that originally with warrior cultures, and he thinks this is not just in the West, he talks about Japan as well and, and Arab culture. Originally, the valuation is good and bad. This is why one of his books is called Beyond Good and Evil. There's no good and evil at the start. There's good, and that's the class of the powerful who call themselves good, um, and this happens in, in, you know, with the Latins, this happens with the Greeks, this happens with the Arabs, this happens with the Iranians. Um, they call themselves good, and then they tell the people who are below them, the servants, uh, the people who are lower class, you're bad. And by bad, they just mean, you're not us. You're not the real people. We're going to boss you around and tell you what to do. And if you don't like it, rise up, and then maybe we'll take you seriously. That's what he calls master morality. Good, life-affirming, bad, just not up to snuff. And, you know, Nietzsche thinks things go all right for a while, and then comes what he calls the slave revolt in morality. Everything gets turned upside down. And the bad, uh, the people who are weak, band together. They have some allies from, from the masters as well. Uh, from what Nietzsche calls the priests, you know, who are kind of renegades. And they manage to get in charge of the culture, and they manage to get in charge of political institutions, and they economic institutions too, they manage to start making money, and they turn things upside down. And their way of evaluating things, their secondary evaluation, is to call what were previously good, evil. This is where the, the distinction between good and evil comes in. The evil are the ones who are, as Nietzsche calls, birds of prey, right? The mean, tough, warrior class people who would exploit you, who if you cross, if you cross them, they'll kill you. Um, they are mean. They are wicked. They do bad things. They are predatory. And those of us who aren't like that, because we're not like that, we're good. Notice that as opposed to saying, listen, I'm good, and if you want to be good, you get in the lists with me and fight. But if not... Shut up, because you're bad. This is, you know, affirming something of me and then affirming it of the other person. In this case, it's denying something and then denying something more. So it's reactive, Nietzsche says.
And it doesn't actually make these people happy. You know, they, they have a sort of dominance for a while. So, you know, Nietzsche was a you know, big foe of democracy, uh, socialism, anything that would put the, the oppressed classes up on top, he was against that. But he wasn't against it just because he was like, screw poor people, you know, they're just dirty or something like that. He thought that this actually subverts genuine morality. Now, we may not agree with that, right? We, I, I'm not a Nietzsche in, in that respect, although I, I certainly experimented with it. Uh, back when I was younger, like I said. But this is what he thinks is going on. Along with this is another process that he calls resentment. And he thinks that our culture is just infected, like, you know, almost like with a virus of resentment. And what resentment is, is when somebody does something to you and you want to respond aggressively, but you've got to choke it back. You can't do it. Maybe, you know, it would get in get in the way of your prospects, or um, they would punish you, or, um, you know, you would lose your, your livelihood or something like that. So you suck it up, and you stew about it, and you engage in some imaginary revenge instead. And eventually, Nietzsche says, this kind of ferments into this, this whole thing that turns into a complex where you're always sort of on the lookout to seek some revenge. Passive-aggressive people are like this, he would say. Um, and they're always looking for targets, and they love to tear things down. But here's where you know Nietzsche's response is: they never put anything new, nothing positive, in, in its place. Nietzsche thinks that our response to nihilism in our present culture has to be going back somehow to this master morality, to this you know affirmative way of, of dealing with things, uh, asserting oneself being okay with being powerful, being okay with other people who are filled with resentment, uh, telling you bad things <coughs> about yourself, and ignoring them so that you can develop fully as, as a person. Yeah. Are you saying resentment? Well, it, it, it's is spelled... Because I'm trying to find it here, and all I see is resentment. Yeah, it's pronounced resentment. Um, who pronounces it that way? Well, the French, it's, it's actually spelled a little bit differently, if you look at it. Um, there's resentment, right? And then there's resentment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, it's a technical that, term. It sounded like you were sure. talking about resentment, but I didn't know this. So think it. about it as resentment on steroids. Yeah. Resentment that has become a, a, like a whole way of, of living. And the person themselves often, they tell themselves stories about how they're not resentful. They tell themselves they're just seeking justice, they're just doing this, they're, they're really a nice guy. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what Nietzsche thinks is at the core of a lot of our current institutions. So, you know, like, just to take a silly example, if, if Nietzsche were around today, he would have hated American Idol. Why the hell should we vote about who sings well, you know? This is crazy putting this to a vote. Um, he'd also hate the top 40, uh, you know, when it comes to music, he probably wouldn't like much of anything, quite, quite frankly, um, of what we do today. But he, he would be against it because it's, it's sort of just the masses running the show, you know. And sometimes we have these demagogues who, you know, are able to mobilize the masses. I, I would say Nietzsche would look at both of our political parties at present and say that they're both mass parties. They both represent coalitions. Neither of them fosters anything like genuine virtue, genuine human, you know, potential. They're both just sort of out for their own constituencies. And they both tell stories about He'd probably say that about most of the parties in Europe, too, <clears throat> quite frankly, um, as well. He wasn't a big party guy. Um, but he would be for the people who are, are doing what, what he uh, eventually is going to call being the Superman, the, the, the Ubermensch. Sometimes we call it the Overman. Earlier in his work, he calls this the free spirit. Um, now, you, you might say, well, who, who the hell is that, <laughs> right? Looking around, <clears throat> is, uh, are, are the people who just, like, roll over everybody else? The, uh, the Superman, it kind of depends. Are they using the apparatus of the state to do that? Are they using some backing from a whole bunch of other people to do that? Maybe they're actually just expressions of, you know, uh, this, this herd morality that, in, in Nietzsche's view. Maybe they're not really doing something that's liberating. Um, but Nietzsche thinks that this is the, the proper response to the, the crisis of nihilism. Now, one thing to point out, is this something that most people could do? No. It's not really an option available to most people. 
So Nietzsche is only writing to a selective group. So I, I don't know that we would actually want to take this on and say, aha, I found my solution to the problem of cultural crisis or anything like that. Nietzsche probably isn't the guy to go to. But he does have some really interesting diagnoses of maybe what is rotten in our culture um, in certain ways. You don't have to necessarily accept the whole story that he's teaching in order to get something out of it, I think. Um, so let's, let's, yeah, let's pause for some questions at this point. I don't understand the concept of the bench. I, I know what the words mean, but yeah. I don't understand what would be, who would be an example of that today. Oh, today. I don't know. Um, there's always a lot of discussion in sort of pop culture once people start reading Nietzsche, like, is this guy an ubermensch? Is this lady an ubermensch? Um, I don't know. Um, I think, I suspect that in a lot of cases we wouldn't know who they are because they're successful in, in doing things and, and not getting um, in the, the public eye because of it. I mean, some people might say big cultural figures like, say, Beyonce mm -hmm. or Oprah would be ubermensch. But then you think, well, what are they advocating a lot of the time? Nietzsche would look at them and say, nope, definitely not, you know. So they don't work. Um, some people, you know, some people were saying Trump is a Nietzschean figure. I think Nietzsche would take a look at Trump and be like, that guy, forget it. Um, no way. He you know, can't control his impulses. Um, you know, he's got to tweet all the time. Definitely needs the approval of other people. I don't think he could be an ubermatch. Um, it's somebody who's like, who does good deeds and doesn't expect to be... Rewarded? Well, that's where it gets kind of interesting. So Nietzsche portrays the Ubermensch as being this very aggressive type, right? Mm -hmm. um, the question is now, why do we do good deeds? Do we do good deeds because we feel we have a moral obligation to? If that's the case, then whatever it is that we have the moral obligation to is in a certain sense more powerful than us, right? So the Ubermensch couldn't be somebody doing that. But if we imagine somebody who just decides to do that sort of thing, and nobody else is going to tell them what to do. And it's sort of an overflowing of their, their capacities and their being. They're going to make a difference in the world. They, they could be an overmatch. Um, but then we wouldn't, we wouldn't really know about it. And, you know, some other candidates, like, would we, do we want to say that these captains of industry, like uh, Bill Gates or... Um, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, yeah. I mean, Steve Jobs is a jerk, but I don't think that being a jerk is enough to do it for a bench, right? Um, or the Amazon guy, Bezos. Um, those would be, I guess, three big ones. Um, could they be? U Uber Mention would be the, the, um, the plural for that. Maybe. Um, I mean, the other thing is, too, so let's say they are Uber Mensch like that. What, what does that mean for the rest of us? You know, do we just like then find them and kind of hero worship them? I know a lot of people did with Steve Jobs, you know, um, but that's not. A, I don't know that that helps us out in nihilism. Uh, Work at a fulfillment center, <laughs> an Amazon fulfillment center. There you go. <laughs> fulfillment. Yeah. I mean, Amazon is a funny one because they, they still, as far as I know, I don't think they've ever shown a profit. And yet more and more money get, and, and more and more of our like economy and our world gets sucked into Amazon. Just a couple days ago, a whole bunch of websites went down. And people are like, what's going on with the Internet? You know, the, uh, here, here's our entitlement mentality. The Internet should be there for me all the time. What the hell is, is happening here, right? People even posted it. You know, here's all the sites that are down. Well, they're all using Amazon Cloud Storage. So there was something wrong with the Amazon Cloud Storage. All those sites go down then. That's how much of an influence they have. You know? But is it something that would, from a Nietzschean perspective, would be a good influence? Or is it just spreading more of the cultural morass, you might say? Um, that's hard to say. Um, yeah. Uh, can I make a suggestion about sure. Ubermensch? Yeah. Paul Newman. Interesting. And, and, and I'll tell yeah, yeah. you why. Um, he was a race car fanatic. Uh, did excelled yeah. in that. Yeah, yeah. Was nominated for 
eight Oscars, I think, finally won one for the... Yeah, clearly a master of his craft. But when his son committed suicide, what did he do? He started Newman's Own. Okay. All of it, all the profit, uh, all, yeah, all the, the not the proceeds, it. all yeah. the profits go to charity. Yeah. So if he's not an ubermensch in in every aspect of his life, uh, and his and his his reaction, his his um, commitment to his marriage, uh, in every way, uh, he excelled. He was above. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess, don't know what Nietzsche would say, but I mean, how can you? Well, so so excelling is part of it, and then it's you can think of motivation. Are you are you doing it because you choose it as the values for yourself? Yeah. Or are you doing it because somebody else is telling you you need to behave like that and be like that, because right? you're satisfying some you know, uh, mom and dad in the background or something like that? I think maybe I think you're right. Newman could be a really interesting example of somebody, as far as we know about him. Who like he, I, he chose this stuff. He, he said, "This is the way I want to live my life." He didn't have to do it, and I don't think there was anybody coercing him. He wasn't doing it to like you know avoid paying taxes or no, something like that. No, and he actually yeah. said but when he was interviewed, "Why are you giving all of your uh, profits away?" And he yeah. said, "I'm a rich man. I don't. What do I need more for?" Yeah. Rather than trying to maximize it and you know make it even more and more and more. Yeah. I mean, with the with with, with Gates in how he divested himself and created a foundation with his wife yeah. fit into that. I don't know. Um, a lot of it would depend on the motivation, and, and I don't I don't know enough about their motivations. I'm not a I don't study captains of industry, you know, <laughs> very much. In their so. case, I know that yeah. they they do uh, um, help me help me see. Uh, to restore eyesight in India, they they oh. support. <clears throat> my friend yeah. is a, a eye surgeon in India, one of the top ones, and that that organization is there simply to uh, basically do cataract surgery and just restore sight to. The, I yeah. think they just only do cataract surgery. Vast amounts, millions, you know. Oh, the Gates Foundation gives to all sorts of stuff. Yeah. you know, National Public Radio is supported by them. Um, they they do. I mean the the um, recent educational uh, thing that everybody had to get behind for a while. What was it called? Um, a lot of people got very angry about it, both on the left and the right. That was that was a Gates initiative. Um, you know the question would be what kind of what kind of values precisely is he being motivated by, and what you know what is sort of the, the effect. Um, is it a good thing to, to remove people's cataracts? I mean, I think you and I would say yes. Um, Nietzsche, you know, insofar as it's enhancing life, I guess you'd probably say yes. Um, if it comes to be seen as something that's like owed, maybe he'd say, ah, that's, that's more of the same herd morality stuff. Um, and this might be where we differ from Nietzsche. You know? um, just because we study somebody doesn't mean we have to agree with, with them 100%. Um, I did also want to talk about Nietzsche's influence on, on later culture. As you know, I mentioned that things really went to pot, you know, not too long after Nietzsche himself died. And if you if you look at the wars that were going on and some of the skirmishes, <clears throat> you can see that there were, trouble was brewing before 1914. Um, but then after you know 1918, things really were in a mess. Nietzsche, by that time, had come to exercise quite an influence on European and even American culture. Um, and by some, Nietzsche gets called nihilistic. You know? uh, he's not actually for nihilism. He sees it as a problem. He's got sort of a response to it. Um, but he was, uh, he was, people started reading The Birth of Tragedy, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, The Will to Power. Um, and and um, really, he gained a great cultural currency, this notion of like the self-made person some people took that in and, and developed that further, the Ubermensch, right? Um, the notion of, of cultural decadence and that somehow we have to revolt against it. Some people used Nietzsche um, to argue for, for fascism. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, when the German soldiers went off to fight, um, many of them went off with Nietzsche and their rucksacks. Um, now, it was a kind of you know, sanitized Nietzsche, uh, to fit that, that, that way of 
understanding things that his sister had helped out with quite a bit, because um, if they'd actually read all of nature, they'd have been like, well, he, he thought anti-Semites were terrible, and uh, German nationalism isn't a great thing either, so maybe we don't, we don't want to take him along. Uh, but he had a, a very big cultural effect. Um, he influenced writer after writer after writer after writer, um, and if you, what's really interesting is that each of them seem to take different things from him. It's not as if there's one totally agreed upon interpretation of Nietzsche. There's all these different Nietzsche's. Thomas Mann took some stuff, Martin Heidegger took other stuff, Ernst Junger took other stuff. Um, they influence each other, um, but you know they, they, uh, they differ as well. Um, and it's still going on today. He still plays an important role within not just philosophy, literary studies, understanding of history, media theory. Um, I, I mentioned people ask the question, is Trump a Nietzschean figure? They can ask that because Nietzsche is still culturally relevant today. Um, or, you know, is ISIS nihilistic? They, they, they look to Nietzsche as one of the people who tells us what nihilism is. Um, so he still has a, a major role. And I think, it, you know, could you have had a Nietzsche, say, two centuries before him? Probably not. Um, Nietzsche thought that nihilism was really going to be the problem of our time. He says in The Will to Power, what I relate is the history of the next two centuries. So the, the century that we, we've seen end and the century that we're living in today. I describe what is coming, what can no longer come differently, the advent of nihilism. For some time now, our whole European culture has been moving as towards a catastrophe with a tortured tension that is growing from decade to decade, relentlessly, violently, headlong, like a river that wants to reach the end, that no longer reflects, that is afraid to reflect. Um, so he thought that nihilism was going to be the fundamental problem. I mean, we might say other things, the environment, right? Clearly, uh, we're in kind of a pickle when it comes to that. We, we can't even uh, con, you know, produce a, a coherent politics about what we ought to do in terms of uh, uh, the massive influence that we've had on, on the environment over the last couple of centuries and what we might do to keep, you know, say, Great Lakes from not being here, right? Uh, uh, not, I mean, not rising to the level where we'd have to worry about it here. Um, we might say that other things are, are bigger issues. But Nietzsche thought that nihilism, in a certain sense, was at the core of all the problems that we're going to encounter. Um, that's kind of a, a big thing to, to say. Um, kind of curious, what do you guys think about that idea? That somehow that cultural malaise would be at the core of all of our problems rather than other things that we might identify, like inequality or environmental issues or, you know, so what you're saying is that Nietzsche had a problem with nihilism. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he thought nihilism was the fundamental problem um, for but, us. But he saw that that was going to become more and more of an issue. Yeah. Yeah, I think, think he... could make the argument he, he's right. Yeah. I think, I, I think he saw himself as, like, somebody who could see what was going on at the time, and other people were, like, in denial about it. Um, and it became harder and harder to be in denial. I mean, I, I think he would look at the present and he'd say, well, most people still don't get it yet, but it's still a fundamental problem. Who's a prophet? Yeah, yeah, I guess you could say he, he viewed... What, what does a prophet do? I mean, traditionally, they, they speak for God. I, I guess you could say Nietzsche is trying to speak for He's humanity. He's a social prophet. yeah. I mean, he, he frames himself as like the herald of the Superman, and you know, he, he wasn't the Superman himself. I mean, he was pretty sickly. He you know, had to lay in bed a lot, went insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, I, I mentioned this to you when I first got here. You read the book uh, "Man's Search for Meaning." Franco, yeah. Now, here's something about Nietzsche, which. Uh, Actually, I didn't know before. When Viktor Frankl was in first a concentration camp and then a death camp in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. he found that the people who survived, because he paid very oh, close yeah, attention, yeah. the people who survived were the ones who had a reason yeah. to survive. 
And Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Right, yeah. And he found out that he wanted to live because he wanted to see his wife again. She died, all his parents died, everybody died. Yeah. But it didn't matter whether they wanted to, whether <coughs> their why was a noble why, I want to see my parents again, I want to go to Israel, or I want to kill as many Nazis as I can. It yeah. didn't matter. They yeah. had a why to live for, and they endured, they bore the how. And I think, I didn't know anything about Nietzsche until yeah. tonight and, and, and what I read in Victor Frankl's book, but it seems to me that you can pick your why. It doesn't matter what your why is. You can bear almost any how if you have a why. Yeah, I think Nietzsche would say if you pick the wrong why and you really invest yourself in it, and then you realize that that's false, you're kind of screwed. But if you pick the why and and you pick it just as it's going to be your why, right? And you say, yeah, like for example, Nietzsche, you know, thought religion was pretty much, you know, just nonsense. Um, it, it had a certain social purpose. That purpose is long since served. You know, all this stuff that religious people talk about, none of it's true. Um, but could you, like, say, yeah, okay, I get that. I still like going to church. Still, still get something out of participating. I'm going to choose it for me, knowing that it's it's all you know nonsense. But it's my nonsense. I think Nietzsche could actually say, "Okay, you go ahead, <laughs> you do that," and that would get you through what you're what you're talking about. You know, um, I mean, it's still better if you can believe <laughs> whatever it is that you're you're having as your why. But but um, yeah. But some wise just wouldn't work anymore, I think, Nietzsche thinks. I mean, it's interesting because the people that he criticizes the most are not the religious people. They're the people of science who think that science like solves everything for us. Um, Nietzsche would be looking at the um, you know, Hawking's and uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson's of our time and saying, these guys don't have any idea what they're doing. They're great at, at doing their little thing, physics, um, you know, cosmology, um, uh, or I mean, astronomy, but when it comes to actually like thinking about life, they, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. When they think that philosophy is dead, they, they're like way out of their element, and they only, they only do that because they're basically the substitutes for what priests used to be back in the day. Um, and, and the people who like, you know, buy into the, um, you know, I effing love science sort of meme stuff, he would say, yeah, they're, they're totally deluding themselves. Um, what science reveals to us is a cosmos that is not only without meaning, but crazy. That doesn't seem to make sense in a lot of cases. Um, it doesn't reveal to us this you know, nice, pure vision that we get in our chemistry textbooks or, or things like that. This is what Nietzsche says. And he's saying this back in the 1800s. You know? Um, so in a way, he is kind of a prophet for, for uh, criticizing that sort of stuff. Yeah. I think, you know, he may have the diagnosis right, but does the he have solution it is yeah. so limited, you know, that I, I guess you have to sort of become realistic to think that that's the cure. Uh, for most of us, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, a legitimate... Um, uh, criticism of, of, of Nietzsche. Um, and that may be where like, we, we want to accept part of the diagnosis and say, okay, that, he's useful for this, but this, this uh, Ubermensch thing, I don't know if I want to get behind that or not. You know? Or could. Yeah. Most people can. Yeah. Quite, quite true. Yeah. I mean, if I met the Ubermensch, he'd probably beat me up and take my stuff. So I don't think I want a lot of Ubermenches around. It'd make me work for him or whatever. I'm not an Ubermensch, <laughs> so. Well, any any other questions or ideas, comments? I don't have any uh, other things prepared, but I'm happy to. Thank you very much. This is really okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah.